Native American legends are among some of the most terrifying. What makes them scarier than your usual ghost story is just how lasting they are. Even today, many people claim to have encountered strange creatures bearing striking resemblance to Native American boogeymen. And today, I have for you some allegedly true horror stories from Native Americans themselves and or about Native American legends and mythology. Prepare for these legends that are more than just legends. If you have a scary true experience of your own and you want to share it with the world, send it to me at darknessprevails.org. Now then, I hope you're ready for the ritual. Kickapoo Meadows from Quincy, location, Illinois. Growing up, my experience with anything paranormal was minimal. I grew up in a small town called Dixmore, Illinois, on the south side suburbs of Chicago. For the most part, Dixmore was and still is a quiet small town with very little happenings and very, very few haunts, at least from my perspective. There are some abandoned houses that haven't been knocked down and reclaimed by nature yet that do give off an eerie vibe. However, there are two places that, without a doubt, are otherworldly. There's an old abandoned steel mill factory off 144th and Wood Street, which is right across from where Al Capone buried his targets. Supposedly, anyway. Me and my friends have ventured on those grounds of the old steel mill and haven't ventured too far in because there are dangerous deep holes one can fall into if you're not careful, and it's inhabited by a pack of stray dogs. But that place is a story for another day. The next place, however, I'm more familiar with because I grew up with it. It was right across the street from me. It's a forest preserve called Kickapoo Meadows. During the day, it looks like an average forest preserve. Lush green grass with wide, wide open fields and a forest in the background dotted with trees here and there. At night, it feels creepy and it takes on a malevolent appearance. The entire town of Dixmore used to be Native American territory that I can believe, especially after doing some research, finding out that I lived close to the border of the Eliniwek and Miami tribes. Perhaps that contributes to the strange things I've been seeing. The thing about Kickapoo Meadows is the fog. It's unusually thick and stays confined to the forest. Even on days where I drove to work, it never spills over onto the roads nearby or onto the two empty lots where houses used to sit. Not only that, but the thing is, when it appears, more often than not, you will see the fog on late nights and early mornings on days where there hasn't been rain at all. I always thought you needed some sort of condensation for it to appear, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, why am I so wary of Kickapoo Meadows? Let me start with this. I was about seven or eight years old. I was with my three older cousins, two boys and a girl. Altogether, our ages ranged from seven to 15. It was summer, so that meant it didn't start getting dark until about eight or 8.30 at night. We were playing basketball. It was me and my cousin who was only a year older than me against his older sister and brother. Needless to say, we lost. However, as the sun set lower, I said we should start heading out as my mom had warned me that I'd be on the receiving end of a belt if the street lights came on before I got back home. By then, the fog had started to roll in before we ever finished playing basketball. Not wanting to get disciplined in front of my cousins, I was the first to start walking through the field back towards home as it was always the quickest way home from the basketball courts. To be honest, I've never walked through the fog either until this time. So I was a bit nervous, especially as it set in so quickly 
and began to make things harder to see. My cousins, on the other hand, were not as tense as me and played around in it for a second. This caused me to lose sight of them. So now I was growing nervous because I was a seven-year-old child who was trapped in the fog and was all alone now. I could no longer hear my cousins. I called out for them, but of course I received no reply. I figured they were going to try and scare me by popping out of the fog somewhere, which prompted me to move towards the exit quicker. I moved in the direction that I believed was home, and I moved slowly until I came to a tree that sat in the middle of the field. There was nothing special or creepy about the tree, but I knew I would be out of the field if I pressed forward. Before I continued on, the youngest of my three cousins, Ramsey, came out of the fog, trying to spook me as he announced himself. Then he asked me if I had seen his older siblings, Tony and Joy. I told him no, and according to him, he had lost them playing in the fog. He concluded that maybe they had walked ahead and were waiting for us back at the house. I agreed, mainly because I just wanted to get out of the fog, but I was relieved to no longer be alone. As we tracked on, I began to feel uneasy, especially since Ramsey wasn't saying anything. He was usually a conversationalist. There was what I could only describe as a tingling sensation going up and down my back. I looked back and of course I saw nothing. Maybe I was just scared and the adrenaline started to pick up. Or maybe something was watching me. Afterwards, me and my cousin Ramsey heard his older siblings, Tony and Joy, calling us as we exited the fog at last and walked into the empty lots that set across the street from my grandma's house. They told us that they had been calling for us for over five minutes, which we dismissed as a lie. We hadn't heard a peep out of them at all. But I believe them now, and I can't help but think of how eerie that was that for some reason we could not hear any sounds outside the fog. The tree that sat in the middle of the field was maybe only 50 to 100 feet away from the entrance point, so we should have been able to hear them. We should have been able to hear something. When we got back home, my mom was waiting for us. She had seen the fog roll in that evening. She demanded to know what took us so long, and I was honest with her. It was almost impossible to see too far in that fog. She looked at the both of us and gave us a stern warning. Don't go into that fog again. You'll get lost and you'll never come out. Now, over the years, that stuck with me because my overactive imagination would try to come up with reasons for why she would say that. I had settled on the idea that she was just trying to mess with us because she knew I had an overactive imagination and she could scare me into behaving better. Either way, I stayed out of that field when it got foggy, mostly because of that sensation I experienced the day I was in it and I wanted to be safe. Fast forward to when I was 16. It was the summer. For years at that point, I had steered clear of the fog. However, one night would prove to be different. I was with three of my best friends, Daniel, Tyler, and Jeremiah. All of them were like brothers to me. Jeremiah was driving, and we had just come back from seeing a movie. I think it was the first Transformers film, and I had already seen it before, but I didn't want to miss seeing it with my friends. So we came to my house at about 9.30. The sun had long since set, and across the street, I saw that the fog in the forest preserve had rolled in. There it is, I said. There's what? Tyler asked. I pointed to my left. The fog. They all looked at it before Daniel said, Y'all want to go inside? Sure, Tyler said, with a shrug of his shoulders. Jeremiah, though, opted to stay in the van. Then their eyes fell on me. I answered quickly, No way, I'm not going in there. 
I quickly recalled my mom's warning. Quit being scared, bro, Daniel said to me. Well, you go then, I told him. I was told not to ever go in there, because you can get lost, and you might never make it out. Bull, Daniel breathed. There isn't anything out there but fog. Yeah, I said, but look at it. It just sits in the field. It's not even inching our way. That is a little creepy, Tyler chimed in. Does it always do that? Sometimes, but I know this is that fog, because it didn't rain today. This just made Daniel more excited. Daniel was the daredevil in our group, and this sounded like something he did not want to pass up. You coming, Tyler? Daniel asked. W what's exactly out there? He asked me. I shrugged. I can't say for sure. I just get this uncomfortable feeling when I see it, I told them. Daniel got out of the van. He was sure that I was being a coward, and Tyler opted to stay in the van after hearing the tone of my voice and the serious expression in my eyes. Daniel walked in front of the van and up to the entrance of the forest preserve, stopping right at the edge of the fog. He looked back at us, like he was giving us a second chance to go with him. We simply stared back, and I could tell that he was beginning to get a bit anxious about going in. After all, I imagine no one wants to be surrounded by fog, especially in the middle of the night. He entered the fog, and after several seconds he disappeared within it, almost like it had swallowed him whole. Every second he was in that fog felt like a minute. I remember looking at Tyler and Jeremiah to see that they were focused on the fog as well, scanning to see if they could spot Daniel or anything for that matter. It was then that we heard it, a howl, a howl so long and loud. It was raspy and it echoed, making it sound like it was coming from all directions. The heck was that? Tyler asked, definitely startled from the howl. S sounded like a wolf. We don't have wolves, was my response. And that wasn't a coyote. Seconds after that, Daniel came bolting out of the fog. He ran up to the van specifically towards the door I was sitting at. He banged on the window, yelling at us to let him in. I opened the door and barely had time to move as he jumped inside and closed it at lightning speed. He locked it and was panting so hard. He was covered in sweat, shaking from head to toe as he stared at the fog. Dude, are you all right? Jeremiah asked. Daniel didn't reply right away. He looked like he was trying to comprehend whatever just happened. I asked him if he heard the howl and he nodded frantically, responding, it, it looked like a wolf. Me, Tyler, and Jeremiah looked at each other. That ghastly sound came from a wolf. I remember looking back thinking I was going to see something, but I never did. Neither of us saw anything that night, save for Daniel, who described this creature as covered in white fur with glowing yellow eyes. He saw it just barely, standing within the fog. That would be the first and only sighting of the white wolf. No one ever reported a run-in with the white wolf, and we decided the only time we would go into that field at night was in a group, but never when there was fog. I remember back in 2014, a year before I moved to Kayamet City, Illinois, Tyler and I were talking about the incident since Daniel and Jeremiah had moved to Tennessee back in 2011. He asked me if I had seen it since then, and I told him no. But every so often, during foggy nights, you can still hear the raspy howl of the white wolf on the old Native American land. 
Black Dog from Marintha. Location unknown. I was a young Native American girl. I must have been around eight years old the first time I encountered the Black Dog. My sister Jessica and I, who was four years older than me, were walking home from spending the night with our grandmother. It was dawn. Our houses were maybe 150 yards apart at most. As we approached the yard of our house, we noticed movement in a part of the yard close to the drive and the dirt road that belongs to the wildlife management. We walked a little closer to see a dog lying in the drive. As we walk a little closer to this dog, something bizarre happened. It was like it moved and it didn't at the same time because one moment it's just lying on the ground and in a blurry instant, it's standing, staring in our direction. I don't remember ever seeing a dog that big. It was bigger than us put together and it was covered in matted, solid black fur. It took me a moment to notice its eyes, but when I did, I shivered. They were red, red like raw anger. Entirely scared, we were ready to run for our lives. The dog, before we could move, began to growl, then bolted off into the wilderness at an unnatural speed. It was gone now, so we took the chance to run for our lives. We ran inside the house and told our mom what happened. She didn't believe us. About a week later, we woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of my mom jumping up, stomping throughout the house and running into our bedrooms to get us up. Something was happening with our little brother. He was four years younger than me and he was crying. She busts into our room and says, do you hear that? Of course we did, but our brother's cries aren't the only thing we heard and I doubt it was my brother's cries that my mom was referring to anyway. There was a sound like something large walking around on the roof, followed intermittently by growls. It was unlike any dog we'd ever heard, but from the sound of the footsteps, it resembled a four-legged animal. This went on for about 10 minutes, then it stopped like nothing had happened at all. My mom, not being superstitious, chalked it off as some stray. But how did it get on our roof? Another week goes by. I'm staying with my grandmother, lying in my bed. I'm suddenly awakened by this god-awful sound again, growling and footsteps. My window was pretty low to the ground at my grandma's. I'm covering my ears and shaking with fright, before suddenly... My grandma runs in and grabs me, taking me back to her bedroom and covering the windows. That night, for my own safety, my grandmother tells me the story of the black dog. It's a Native American legend. It's said to be a spirit that protects the land. Having a Native American heritage myself, I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to fear the black dog or respect it. After all, why would my grandma, who knew the story, act so afraid of it and try to protect me from it? Maybe it has something to do with us living within walking distance to a cemetery. From then on, I stayed far away from the cemetery and I no longer walked around outside at night. From then on, I would do anything to keep from encountering the black dog. I think something is following me. From Maddie. Location, Idaho. I was 17 years old, and this happened last winter. Me and some of my friends usually would stay at my house, hanging out over the long weekends or during breaks we had due to the weather. My room was pretty big, and it was in the basement, we would always be down there. It was the best spot, 
seeing as I had four younger siblings who liked to get really noisy. One night, me and a good friend were having a sleepover. It was around 2 a.m. We were doing everything we could do to scare ourselves, sharing ghost stories and whatnot, getting our adrenaline pumping. We were a couple of bored high school kids. What else were we to do that night? We decided to sneak out since it had stopped snowing at the time. We would message a few friends to see who was awake, but no one else was. Can't say I was surprised. As we were walking around, my friend started to tell me about how a week ago before this, she was playing with some crystals and satanic things. We had another friend that was really into witchcraft. They had used a Ouija board together and were trying to communicate with someone or something on the other side. I immediately told her that that sounds like a terrible idea. I've always been a pretty paranoid person. Even though I like to be scared, I set boundaries. And I told her that Ouija boards are just too sketchy and that that's a line you should never cross. My friend is very much Native American. She's curious of and wants to be attuned with the spiritual world. There's a lot she believes and doesn't believe. Of the things she believes, that includes skinwalkers and Wendigo. Those stories in particular absolutely terrify me. She mentioned about how in the reservation there's always sightings and stories of people who have encountered them, even in these modern days. Well, a few weeks after her telling me this out in the snow, I was lying on the couch in the upstairs room some time in the morning. I was sitting there watching Netflix. I decided to head off to bed after finishing a whole season of a show I'd been watching. As I was walking toward the stairs, I noticed a dark, misshapen figure standing near it. The window was a good five feet off the ground, and this thing was four more feet above it. I froze, staring at it, to see if I was just seeing things and to let my eyes adjust. Then I opened the gate at the top of the stairs and walked down, slowly still watching out the window. The figure turned, and even though I didn't see any specific features, I could feel its eyes drilling into me. I then ran the rest of the way down the stairs, and I hid inside my room. I then heard heavy footsteps outside, walking around the back side of the house where my room was. There was a horrible smell, like walking into a dump full of rotten skunks and fish. I then remembered the things my friend told me about the creatures and spirits of Native American legends and about the things she tried to contact, and I started to think maybe she was successful. I was told once by her that if you talk about these creatures too much, you might start seeing them. I quietly cried, trying not to let the thing outside hear me. I eventually passed out and woke up to the sound of my parents yelling at each other outside. Something had torn up and devoured our chickens and ducks, as well as our turkeys and cats. Our horse was out in the field, hiding. Luckily, it was fine, but it was startled from something. Now I don't talk about these things at all, and I never go outside alone after dark, and I especially don't talk about those Native American spirits. Werewolf From Just Another Dude Location, Georgia I've only shared this story with two other people, one of them being my wife, and the other a close friend. I grew up hunting and fishing. I was taught from an early age to understand and respect wildlife, nature, and all the animals that dwell within it. I was taught to hunt and survive out there. My family is Native American, and our teachings have always been passed down like this throughout the generations. Nowadays, I am often requested to guide people on new land that they purchase or lease for hunting, 
as I'm well known locally for my ability to read wildlife signs. I say all this to you because you need to understand that not much scares me out there. I'm not intimidated by what's in the woods or the water. But on the evening of November 12th, 2005, I was more scared than I've ever been. A friend of mine and I were on an evening deer hunt on a very old farm in middle Georgia. My friend was complaining about trail cameras going missing. So after the hunt, we were going to wait around and watch to see if anyone was snooping around and taking his cameras. The hunt was lousy. It was unseasonably cold and the sky was perfectly clear with a bright moon, but not much was coming up. Legal hunting times had ended, so I was waiting at the base of my stand to listen for my friend's truck to come back down the road to pick me up. After a few minutes, I heard him honk the horn. The area I was in was an old cutout bowl-shaped depression where an abandoned mica mine was. There's a natural spring that flows out of the mine, and I remember how eerily quiet it was. The only sound to be heard at the moment was the water trickling in the spring coming out of the mine. I squatted down and got a drink of water, then began my hike out of the woods. After walking about 200 yards, I came to the old trail that bordered a dense pine thicket and the hardwoods where the mine was. I stopped for a minute to shuffle my backpack and to change the arm I was carrying things with. I froze in place. When I stopped moving, I heard footsteps continue for three or four more steps, then stop as if they realized they were being heard. Now this area we hunt in is known to have wild hogs and coyotes, and as such I had brought protection to deal with it, just in case. I took my pin light and clipped it to the bill of my hat, then I checked to make sure I was loaded. The sound I had heard was not hog or coyote steps either. This was much bigger and had a longer stride more akin to a man. Slowly, as if I was stalking a deer, I began to walk. When you stalk hunt, you make four to five carefully placed steps, then stop to survey the area for a few minutes while looking and listening for movement. The light on my cap was not turned on at this point. If you have good moonlight and your eyes are well adjusted, you keep the light off and trust only your eyes and ears but I didn't hear or see a thing. I stayed still for several minutes. I stalked five long, quiet steps, then stopped again. At this point, I was over ten yards away from my initial stop. I froze. I could hear breathing now. It sounded like what can only be explained as a large dog or a bear sniffing for someone's scent. You know the sound. Huff, huff, sniff, sniff, like a dog makes when he knows you have his favorite treat. Think about that for a minute. My friend and I, Dwight, have played some crazy pranks on each other over the years. So standing there, I flat out said, Dwight, what are you doing, man? I'm ready to go. But all I heard in return was a very low, guttural growl. Immediately, I stalked in a strafing position across the path with my weapon drawn and pointed it back down the path from the direction I came from, the direction of that growl. I knew that wasn't Dwight, and I knew it was hunting me. I made my way quietly up the opposite side of the path toward where Dwight was waiting. I could hear his engine running now, and I could hear footsteps getting closer. I stopped and listened briefly, now, in a very thick pine thicket, it's hard for a decent dog to track its game. That was the only advantage I had, and I used it. I kept moving, and I was now where I could see the glow of Dwight's headlights up the path. I raised up my Glock, and I fired three times in rapid succession, signaling to Dwight that I was in distress, and hopefully scaring this thing. But... Branches and limbs cracked behind me as I ran, and I heard this god-awful 
brow. No, they were words. Get out. What I heard was a mix of a human voice and a deep predator-like growl. 20 yards from Dwight's truck, and I see a muzzle flash and hear the crack of a high-powered weapon. I see Dwight leaning on the hood of his truck and aiming in my direction. From behind me, extremely close, there's a deep scream and howl. I don't look back. I run faster than before. In Dwight's truck, with the windows up and the doors locked, Dwight is looking down the path in shock. I ask him, What did you see? But he doesn't answer. I shook him, and then he points his finger down the path. I see yellowish-green glowing eyes standing just a bit over six feet on the left side of the path, and a dark figure similar to a man's standing on two feet but covered in fur. The silhouette is darker than the night. It squats down, looks like it's licking a wound, then raises back up and smashes an oak tree that's six inches across with its hand. The tree doesn't fall, but we saw bark and chips flying from it. In the light, we could see it looking at us in a standoff. With lips rolled up, we could clearly see its ears and teeth. It looked old, like an old man. One fang was broken and part of an ear was missing. Dwight backed out slowly, but I kept my eyes in the direction of where we saw the creature. Then we peeled out and headed back towards safety. The following day, Dwight and I took different weapons and went right back to the spot where we last saw it. We found the tree smashed to bits. There were patches of red and hair on the ground. We took samples of it. Something weird happened while we were there. An old man, the one who owned the property, as well as his helper, pulled up. The helper said that the old man asked that we not come back and hunt here. Dwight was the original person who got permission, and we had done a lot of fence repair to get that permission. He started toward the old man's truck, and the helper stopped him. He said, referring to the old man, he got hit by one of his bulls yesterday, and he ain't feeling too well. He asked me to bring him down here and ask you fellas not to come back and to be nice about it, but we don't want no one here. The helper then took cash from his pocket, handing Dwight 500 bucks and me 200 for the work we did on the fence. We got our deer stands and we got out. We never found the cameras that we had set up there that went missing, and to this day we haven't gone back. We did get word from the old man's nephew when he angrily told Dwight that the old man passed a week later due to his injury from this bull. The nephew did extend an offer to hunt there again, but we refused. The nephew made a comment about, that's probably for the best. I don't think I want to know how that all ties in together, but I'm sure you can use your imagination and figure it out. Every word of this is true, but it's up to you to believe it or not. A Woman Named Cassie From Keene Location, New Mexico I come from a reservation in southeast New Mexico. Every year we have a ceremonial celebration that is open to the public. Traditional crown dancers, performances of other tribes, parades, music, a rodeo, and a good crowd. There was nothing unusual compared to other years prior. But like any big event, some planning and safety precautions are to be considered beforehand. Little did I know, I was going to be a part of this event. The tribal vice president had personally asked me if I could be the head of the security detail in charge of guarding the livestock for the bull riders and performers at the rodeo grounds. I agreed to the job. It was only four days long, had good pay, 
and it was the night shift. That was a relief, because it meant it was going to be nice and quiet. I was wrong, though. To this day, I rarely attend the events anymore, as I may just run into this creature again. It was July 5th, 2015, the second night of the celebration. It had been raining and I was drenched. Being a US Marine, you could say that I was used to being out into the elements. At a certain point, it finally stopped raining. I had a team of six people that night and they were finally beginning to show up. They didn't have security experience, but beggars can't be choosers. They were on their routine patrols in no time and I was soon by myself, checking on them from time to time to make sure they were doing what they were supposed to. They were talking, laughing, and telling jokes a lot, but with it being quiet out, I let them be to help them pass the time. The clouds broke, exposing a full white moon. It allowed us to see much better that night. I noticed in the northwest corner of the parking lot a yellow Toyota. One of my teammates came to me, Linda, I think, and was a little concerned because they were drinking. I told Linda just to leave them be. Our concern was the bulls, horses, and other animals in the corrals. She agreed and resumed her patrol. It was 11.47 p.m. All was still quiet in the darkness when a voice in the distance pierced the silence. Cassie! Cassie, where are you? It was the occupants of the parked Toyota in the parking lot. Irritated, I went to see what the problem was. I encountered them near the bleachers and asked if everything was all right. They were obviously drinking and seemed quite concerned. They introduced themselves as father and son, Tom being the son and Frank the father. I gave them my name and asked a second time what was wrong. She's gone, sir, just gone. She disappeared, like a skinwalker, I remember thinking. Yeah, right, but I kept that to myself. I set them down on the bleachers and told them to wait right there with the rest of my team. I strapped my LED light to my head, and I told one of my team members, Barry, to open the gate and make his way back in case law enforcement was called. He took his Suburban and did what I told him to. I looked at the two men who were still feeling scared. I told them to tell me what happened and to be serious this time. We were having some beers, just having a good time. I turned around and she was gone. I didn't hear her get out of my car and I didn't hear anything, Tom said. I am skeptical because they were intoxicated, but to put them at ease, I said I'd take a look. The car was parked near a tree line about 75 yards where I was. I turned on my LED headlight and I made my way up to the car. There were empty beer cans all over the place front and rear of the car and three windows rolled down, indicating to me that someone was in the back. As I said before, it had rained that night, so I looked down out of the car and there were shoe prints in the mud. They went into the tree line. I thought maybe she went to the bathroom or got sick. I follow the shoe prints. They went about 25 yards into the tree line. My LED lights were very bright, so I could make out the prints very easily. Then I stopped, because the shoe prints just vanished. They ended in one spot and didn't return. No tracks leading back to the car either. Just nothing. They're obviously way too intoxicated, I thought. I circled around and made my way down to the car. I searched the car one more time, and again, it was empty. This time, right when I turned around, I heard a loud hissing noise, almost like a cat's, but oddly different. There was an undertone like a low scream blended with the hissing. I looked, and ten feet away was a massive black cat. It was a little over the size of a full-grown golden retriever. This cat had huge paws, paws that looked more like hands covered in fur, and its eyes were human in shape, not like a feline's. Its front legs were deformed looking, as if they were broken in the same places on each side. Patches of fur were missing, and its skin was mangy. 
I could smell it. It smelled pungent and rotten. It stared at me with orange-reddish eyes. It appeared to be daring me to move. I knew this cat was no normal feline. As I looked into those eyes, it felt like something was trying to take over my thoughts in my head. My mind kept getting darker and darker, as if I was being hypnotized. I closed my eyes and shook my head. I looked at another part of it besides its eyes, and slowly my thoughts came too. I had my K-bar, and I reached for it, unbuttoning the handle. That's when the strangest thing happened. It looked at my hand on the blade. It appeared to recognize it as a weapon. It arched its back and, crazy enough, stood up on two legs. I withdrew the K-bar, waiting for this thing to attack, but it walked backwards like a person, never taking its eyes off me. It backed away into the tree line, standing on all fours again, then ran into the trees, disappearing into the darkness. Now I'm a veteran, decorated too, but that was the first time I was truly scared in almost 13 years. I called Barry over the radio. I told him to pick up Tom and Frank and take them to the police substation. He drove up in his Suburban, flashing his spotlight into the tree line. He came up to me and was concerned because I seemed confused, and I had a hard time finishing my sentences, as my mind was obviously jumbled. Then he asked me a question that sent a chill down my spine. Did you see the girl? She was standing in the trees. I shined my spotlight on her, and she kept looking at you. She took a few steps and seemed to just disappear in the bushes, as if she squatted down. Th that's why I was checking the tree line before I got here. Boss, you okay? No, I said. D just take Tom and Frank and take them to the station. Then get back here fast. Take Linda with you. No one goes alone. Sure thing, boss. I'm on it, he replied. Barry and Linda returned to find the team all on the bleachers. I waited for them to arrive until I could say anything. Here's what's going down. We split into teams of two, three people a team. No one is patrolling by themselves tonight, and I want radio checks every 15 minutes from everyone. Stay in the light when you can, and stay away from the tree line in the northwest corner. Do you understand? All confused as to the sudden change in my demeanor, they agreed. Thank God. We finished the night without another incident. Then they began pestering me about what I saw, and I finally told them. They started telling me about their experiences as well. Many of them claimed to have seen a woman. She was walking around the grounds. The animals would act weird around her. Horses would kick the fences when she got close, and bulls would bang their heads against the corrals in an attempt to get at her. They attempted to talk to the girl, but all they could get from her was, my name is Cassie. Needless to say, I wasn't going to sleep that night. I decided to watch the rodeo as the day shift arrived. I said nothing more about my experience and I told the team not to speak of it. Then the rodeo started. Huge crowd, loud noise and cheering. Then I walk right into them, Tom and Frank again, and this time, it's who I assume must be Cassie. Tom and Frank say hello. I told them I'm glad they're doing okay, and then I see the woman. You must be Cassie, I say. She looked at me for a few seconds, and those eyes, they were the same orange-reddish eyes I saw in that creature. Yeah, this is Cassie, Tom said. I felt strange that Cassie said nothing but I noticed Tom was doing all the talking for her. Yet every word he spoke, Cassie kind of swayed slightly back and forth. Cassie, are you okay? I asked. Once again, Tom spoke for her. Yeah, she's fine, thank you. I said okay. Enjoy your day. And oddly, as they walked away, they turned in unison, walking in the same manner, their legs synchronized. 
Yet under my breath and even with the scores of people making such noise, I quietly said, I know what you are. Now, Cassie and only Cassie turned toward me. It was like she heard every word I whispered. She smiled, then turned and walked away, driving away in their Toyota. I never believed in skinwalkers before, but I stood face to face with one of those creatures. The Navajo believe in these beasts. I'm not Navajo, I'm Apache, but skinwalkers, oh, they're very, very real. They were here before us. They saw what lived and lurked on these lands long before we thought to dwell in them. They fought and survived against the horrors that have now become not more than stories, or that's simply what we wish to believe, because these stories still hide in the darkness, in the wilds, and they stalk those who are foolish enough to take the legends for granted. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode of Darkness Prevails, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you have a story of your own you'd like to share, you can send it to us at darknessprevails.org. If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash darknessprevails or shop our merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash darknessprevails. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video about five creepy hitchhiker stories. Kane Sevenify says, Going my way? Sure thing, if you're going down to the underworld. Kristen Willie says, This is how I get through my work night. I hope you mean listening to stories, because if you're hitchhiking for your work night, I think you'd better find a different job. Wonderblocks Production says, Let's hear some tornado stories. That would be fun, but I feel my channel's better suited for paranormal and unexplained sightings and encounters, and the occasional bizarre and creepy encounter with weirdos. But that's not to say tornado stories wouldn't be horrifying. Emily Wien says, I picked up a hitchhiker once. I was feeling brave that day. Luckily, he wasn't creepy or anything. You got lucky that time. Just wait until you pick up that one guy who has a hitchhiking chainsaw. Alpha Fuglo says, I was gonna hitchhike tomorrow, but I don't know about it anymore. I think I'd rather save up a few months pay just to get a down payment on a car than hitchhike. People are just creepy. Well, that brings us to the end of this Darkness Prevails episode. But don't you worry, more scary tales are on the way soon. So stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who continue to donate to keep this channel alive. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.